Okay. Okay, now. Can you see me? Yes, we can see okay. you. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we can start with you. Do you want me to switch off my camera? After five minutes, let okay. everyone see you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll start. Yes, I'm ready. Yes, yeah. I'm ready. So on behalf of uh, the Directorate of Visiting Professors Program of Goa University, I welcome all of you today again for the third session of the aspects of the Nalanda tradition, where we have uh, Ben Kempo Tashi Sering, who's going to give us a, a third lecture today. And he's going to speak on the nature of consciousness. So I give the mic to Geshila and okay. request him to uh, start his lecture. OK. Yes. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. So modern technology has great benefits. Also, it has lots of <laughs> challenges. <laughs> OK. Uh, so let me know when you want uh, me to turn off my camera. Just let me know. I will do that. Uh, In another five minutes. So okay. we get a better uh, so, voice quality. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. So the, uh, once again, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to share some of the you know, the Nalanda master, great Nalanda masters uh, thoughts, uh, particularly uh, working with our inner world, uh, that is our thoughts, emotions, uh, and also some of those, you know, extremely helpful and useful mental states to be uh, enhanced, to be cultivated within ourselves not necessarily uh, in, a, in a religious context, but in a just secular uh, context that, uh, you know, uh, uh, although the, these great masters, as I briefly mentioned yesterday, as well as day before yesterday, all those great masters were, you know, mainly uh, following uh, the, the teachings of the Buddha, Nevertheless, many of the, you know, the, uh, what you call the knowledge, their understandings and their advice uh, and their, you know, the, what they left for us as a gift, these are still extremely uh, relevant to the general public. And uh, that is what uh, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, and also here, you know, the, uh, led by the Vice Chancellor of Goa University and uh, you know the the department's director, uh, Professor uh, you know uh, Kaka and also other uh, there, you know the Dr Anita and all other those people who involved to organize this, uh, which is not that easy with the you know using uh, the modern technology which has many uh, challenges. But nevertheless, the main purpose is really to uh, some of those ancient Indian uh, masters, not necessarily purely Buddhist masters. These Buddhist masters like uh, Nagarjuna and, uh, you know, the, the, the historical Buddha Gautama himself, uh, all, you know, th those great masters, uh, you know, they have tremendous uh, exchange with the other ancient uh, Indian spiritual uh, masters, you know, Indian spiritual masters. There's no doubt, you know, the, if we look at, for example, uh, the, some of those two, the, the two great masters which I mentioned yesterday, you know, in terms of the cultivation of epistemology and Buddhist logic, Dignak, 
uh, 5th century and the Dhammakide around the 7th century or 6th or 7th century. They, you know, this amazing understanding and knowledge in those areas are very much the result of having a constant, you know, the exchange and, and debate and sometimes very serious, you know, <laughs> debate with the other non-Buddhist ancient Indian uh, masters who are also very, very learned and uh, uh, practitioners. Uh, so that is the here where we are. That's where we are. And, uh, you know, something which, first of all, as a Indian, ancient Indian culture, and it is not just pure culture. Uh, it is, uh, these are, uh, these masters, you know, the knowledge, and the teachings are uh, tremendously, still extremely relevant, particularly working with our thoughts and emotions and so forth. Uh, you know, the, as uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama says very often, you know, though in in the West or in the modern society, there are you know the fields like psychologies, psychotherapies, psychoanalysis so on and so forth, you know, uh, from in the from the Western point of view in those fields, you know, started maybe uh, around, uh, you know, the uh, uh, 17, 18, 19 centuries, you know, the common era, like the Jung, uh, Freud, and the others, you know, there were many, uh, and then slowly developed these uh, means and methods to help uh, human beings when we are, you know, when we face uh, challenges, which is, you know, the nature of our lives. Though, you know, we all uh, uh, want very strongly from, uh, from, from, our, from our heart, want very, you know, peaceful, uh, healthful, uh, healthy, and very, prosperous life, individually, family member, society, and the community. But in reality, you know, uh, quite often we, uh, what, we face challenges. And many of these challenges we try to solve, we try to overcome uh, using, you know, the uh, uh, lots of external, uh, what you call the means and methods but there are challenges, you know, no matter how, how powerful the external means and methods, including money, uh, beautiful houses, or cars, or, you know, all the medicines, you know, very modern, you know, to develop uh, those medicines. But still, you know, there are uh, challenges which only can overcome when we... Uh, work with our inner world, that is our thoughts and emotions and uh, behaviors. And uh, that is what here in uh, these Nalanda masters, you know, they really for generations after generations, passed down from one generation to another generations, built on, you know, the, uh, their own experiments, analysis, investigations, meditations and so on and so forth then you know uh, what you call the you know the explains how our inner world works and functions and how that really how should we work with our inner world our thoughts emotions and behaviors uh, and that is what here you know the one of the main reasons particularly in this you know the 21st century Though the modern technology has advanced tremendously, particularly, you know, the, uh, this, uh, the last century and also in this century, uh, but the human uh, challenges, basic human challenges, difficulties, predicaments, uh, still in front of us, you know, uh, and, uh, in front of us. And therefore, uh, you know, the, like, like his own Mr. Lamas and many other, you know, contemporary 
thinkers. They say we have to search, as you know, uh, we have to search uh, in, uh, means and methods, something you know within ourselves, not always go outside to sort it out our challenges or the difficulties. And in that case, you know, these Nalanda masters, you know, the, for nearly, you know, uh, 1,200, 300 years of, you know, the knowledge, uh, which kept in, you know, now, uh, uh, of course, in other, you know, the uh, communities, but also in the Tibetan communities, uh, Tibetan community, and this, you know, very well-established uh, monastic, you know, the uh, communities have still keep this uh, knowledge and it is really something uh, important to not to just keep here but to share with the so that is uh, once again to remind ourselves why why we are here and why we are having this uh, this course okay just to once again to you know uh, to say that and I thought it's important to uh, uh, to repeat that again and again. Now the uh, as I said uh, yesterday, uh, once again I'm I'm going to repeat briefly those two very basic doesn't need deep philosophical interpretation or knowledge or understanding yet extremely helpful, useful, and which also, you know, uh, repeated by these great masters uh, to, uh, uh, to, to apply in our daily lives, in our daily lives, uh, either in the monastic or, you know, like a, uh, monks, nuns, or in the community or in the family, mothers, fathers, you know, the children, cousins, nephews, or in the uh, workplace. That is really the first thing is either in the morning or during the day, you know, to really to build or bring within ourselves a, a positive uh, intention or the motivation how we are going to spend this particular day. You know, the 17th, of March uh, uh, 2021, you know, this Wednesday. I, as an individual in within these seven billion human beings, you know, I, as an individual, you know, I will spend my day minimum, minimum, not deliberately, not intentionally going to cause pain and difficulties to others. That kind of, you know, the, which we all are able to do that. You know, which all are able to do that. And uh, then a little bit in uh, what's called advance, uh, saying if, if I get the opportunity, if I get a chance to help to somebody, that can be just simple, very simple, just giving a glass of water, somebody who badly needs have a thirst, or just simply showing a direction, somebody who lost their direction and ask you. Uh, and then just with the heart, good heart showing that. So, you know, very deliberately, very intentionally, uh, setting that kind of intention, how we are going to spend this day or this hour or this moment. And for example, this during this conversation, my participating in this conversation, this lecture is something I, I can live this line, at least minimum intentionally, deliberately, not causing harm to others, others' lives, others' status, others' environment, which is nowadays very, very important. You know, the, our, compared to maybe a few centuries back, 
you know, the, as the, the, uh, the term is used, you know, the, the, the global is getting smaller and smaller. That doesn't mean the physical, you know, uh, the planet is getting smaller. What does that mean? As we all know, we are interacting more and more. We are sharing more and more the, uh, what is in the, on this planet. And uh, one, for example, a simple, simple example to, you know, being a little bit aware of uh, how to keep, you know, the, not to throw away the water bottles that we, plastic bottles that we just bought few, you know, a few hours ago when the hot weather, you know, we need to drink a lot. Or just taking a simple, a, you know, recircle, recircle bottle and you can fill, fill, fill the bottle and something simple that how you, how we're going to spend our day. And then during the day, try to stay, try to follow with that morning, you know, the positive intention that we set. And that is what here, one of the, our topic, you know, the, our last, maybe when I come to, you know, the, what you call the, you know, the, to, uh, to, to go next, next month, training the mind. Training the mind, these masters, Nalanda masters, training the mind is not just, you know, switch on and off, not in that way. These masters, you know, they talk about training the mind is step by step. And starting from the very simple that we all can do, very simple, doable, starting from there. So today I have added a little bit on that first part. And, uh, I, and I would say a little bit on in here. Some other masters have particularly some, yeah, anyway, some other masters have said, and then, then at the end of the day, end of the day, before going to sleep, end of the day, have a simple, you know, uh, what you call the observation, how we manage to spend our day. Have we managed to spend our day as morning we set our this positive intention or some of the our actions, some of the, our thoughts, some of the, our you know, activities uh, gone against that morning intention, which is, you know, happens, which, is hap which happens, which happens quite often. No matter how much we try, some days things go wrong. That's also reality. So the, that kind of, uh, you know, simple, not being too critical to ourselves. If that day, you know, day our uh, uh, activities, our interaction with the other, other our colleagues and friends didn't go as we planned in the morning, our motivation, just to acknowledge, accept it, not to beat ourselves badly. Sometimes, you know, uh, we do, particularly I notice in the West. In the West, sometimes they are very too critical to uh, oneself. And that causes lots of stress, lots of stress. But on the other hand, which I, you know, uh, which I tease my uh, Western friends, but also same time, don't, you know, don't be too relaxed like some of Tibetans we do. You know, the Tibetans, oh, that's all right. You know, if it didn't happen today, uh, I will do tomorrow. Or if it didn't happen this lifetime, I will do next lifetime. But that is a too relaxed attitude or culture, but in the middle. So that is, if we manage to do, that, spend the day uh, close to the morning, our intention, then read really again, once again, to acknowledge, okay, I've done quite well today, then start again, tomorrow is new day, do continue that. So that's the first thing. And uh, so uh, what I've done, you know, my, my general structure of this, this lecture, is not just pure academic definitions, division, definitions and list and list, which although the university level may be quite helpful, but in the practical level, 
not that much helpful. And here, I, you know, I have planned mixture of both. And this is, you know, something. Then other one is that you remember, I'm sure people who are here yesterday and day before yesterday, because I repeated, uh, giving five to seven minutes to ourselves to really to experience our, you know, basic, basic states of our mind, which is calm, relaxed, and, you know, still and the clarity. That kind of mental quality. You know, in, usually it says, you know, stillness and the clarity. Stillness in the sense mind is not easily be distracted by the, you know, the external noise, smell, taste, whatever, or internal remembering past or wishing future, not in that way, not easily be distracted by those affairs but able to stay to the present moment right here and now. And with that, that kind of stillness also combine or with the quality of clarity. You know, uh, just stillness alone is not necessarily helpful without clarity. You know, when we sleep, good sleep, sound sleep, stillness is there in certain extent because mind is not distracted. It is completely flat, but there's no clarity. So what we need is, so to really to experience our basic, basic or the general structure of our mind, particularly the, the mental state, not the sense consciousnesses. Uh, sense consciousnesses are slightly different, but mental consciousness, to experience that kind of, stillness and the clarity we need to give you know regularly to give five uh, five to seven minutes watching our breath or something sound playing some you know simple sound like in the indian tradition like in that uh, very nice you know sound om which has in some some I don't have nice voice, <laughs> so some people have a nice voice when they chant that, and simply placing our our mind with that, or just you know simply you know when when we place our hands on our knees, that simple you know that touch the wound as soon as place our hands on our knees, you know there's this sense of warmness. And simply not giving any interpretation, not saying, oh, it is nice, or not saying it is, you know, but simply acknowledging that and your, our, our mind stay, stay with that. So using these techniques, which uh, we will explore further, you know, the, uh, so those two things, are, as I mentioned, uh, you know, really try to, uh, uh, apply, see how it works, how it works. And uh, my uh, my own experience, and um, I share this all the time when I lead classes, you know, the people really uh, uh, feel, uh, you know, doing that in a regular basis, uh, it really benefits. Uh, so this is uh, which I want to repeat uh, because of the nature of our talk. Okay, so today uh, our our main uh, topic. We are going to going to touch on again, once again, nature of the mind. Then we will move on a little bit further, you know, the, a little bit further. So now yesterday, nature of the mind, I, I briefly uh, touch on yesterday, briefly touch on yesterday, which is, you know, the, uh, the Buddhist my, uh, or, or these Nalinda masters, these Nalinda masters, you know, among them, there is a common agreement when they talk about what is the nature of mind, what is nature of mind. That is, which I mentioned yesterday, you know, uh, clear and knowing, that's the one, you know, the way to 
uh, express uh, one way to you know explain the nature of the mind uh, and uh, all uh, luminous and you know the knowing or aware or awareness that they are slightly so that is one way to explain now you know when it comes to and uh, more a uh, detailed philosophical interpretation with the meaning of clear and knowing, then, you know, there are diverse interpretations, diverse interpretations, uh, what you call the, this uh, great Indian, uh, which I mentioned uh, uh, several times, you know, the, uh, yesterday and already today, you know the uh, the Dhammakirti, Dhammakirti seventh century. This Buddhist uh, epistemologist, you know, the, in one of his uh, very very important texts uh, to explain, you know, to uh, to to extend or to explain further, you know, the uh, based on not his direct teacher, but uh, based on Dignac's concept of epistemology and Buddhist logic and the, one of the, those texts is called Exposi Exposition of Valid Cognition Pramana Pramana Vatika Pramana Vatika you know written by uh, Dhammakirti Dhamma and uh, today I will just want to quote uh, two verse uh, two two lines from that uh, text and it has uh, four chapters four chapters and today's quotation is from the second chapter and uh, it is translated like this from uh, you know uh, tibetan to english the nature of the mind is luminous uh, luminous clarity the stains are advantages the stains are advantages so the nature of the mind is luminous clarity which we talked yesterday a little bit but then the second line, which we have, uh, which uh, I didn't say uh, yesterday, and the second line says stains are advantages, and this is uh, something you know the, uh, for us, not just only philosophically but also in the practically useful uh, you know statement uh, made by these great Indian logicians. Now the stains refers to those distorted uh, mental states, such as jealousy, envy, anger, you know, the attachment, aversion, grasping, avidya, ignorance. These are the, and uh, you know, called stains, or these are the called afflictions, or delusions. There are many different terms are used, you know, uh, uh, Kalish in, in Sanskrit or, you know, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, my Sanskrit pronunciations completely, you know, <laughs> uh, and, uh, nobody will understand, but uh, that is here. So what Dhammakiti said in here, in relation to when he talked about the nature of the mind, luminous clarity, and stains are advantages, advantages in the sense, the stains, like I list these, you know, there are many, these distorted mental states, these unhealthy mental states. When I say distorted or the unhealthy, I'm not talking about from the religious point of view, unhealthy or, uh, you know, the distortion, distorted in the sense when, 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 for example, when jealousy occurs, when anger occurs within ourselves, whatever the reason, external or in, you know, whatever the reason, occurrence, occurrence of jealousy that makes individual very, very painful, very, very unhappy. And that is here, you know, the meaning of uh, distortion or stain, stain. How can we demarcate 
what are the stained mind or what are the distorted mind and what are the not distorted mind it only you know uh, the, the, the uh, demarcations are made by these great in the, uh, by these great nalanda masters the mere occurrence of certain mental states that occurrence you know what you call causes the individual unhappy you know unpleasant and uh, pain and so on and so forth then that is more or less that's mental state is more or less we can call it affliction or certain mental state may not cause pain straight away you know to individual but longer term when time passes due to that occurrence of that mental state individual experience pain so th- that is something which here which uh, uh, stain refers to the distorted or you know the uh, uh, afflic- affliction or afflicted mind and why did he use the term advantages advantages here the meaning advantages here is you know saying though they may very much ingrained ingrained within our psyche within our mental in the these master term the term is used, within our mental continuum this continuum is something important do you remember yesterday when i talk about mind consciousness or the you know awareness it is a, not a enduring uh, thing it is a event or activities or the process of you know the knowing or process of experiencing moment by moment by moment and it, because of that nature quite often these great nalanda masters they also use uh, i don't know the sanskrit term in in english you know or in tibetan samgi gu or sometimes it called samgi gu mental continuum mental continuum you know that had some kind of uh, you know implication of mental state either positive or negative or no valid or invalid it has a some sort of you know uh, moment by moment by moment by moment you know process of uh, or the events so the uh, these these you know the uh, stains or the those distorted affliction mind though they may deeply ingrained within ourselves but they are not one with the, our basic mental states of the mind when i say one with that means if we want to get rid of those stains you know if if those stains were one with our basic mental uh, nature of the mind then to get rid of these mental uh, these stains you know basic nature of the mind has to be eliminated which is the not the case and this is you know or uh, it is a little bit philosophical point of view but it has that kind of nature uh, so uh, which is quite useful to uh, remember that okay now then the, and um, you know the uh another thing which i want to talk uh with the nature of the mind uh, connection to the nature of the mind is this uh these nalanda masters i think it might be the same non buddhist you know uh, uh other ancient indian scholars and masters it might be the same although i'm not you know, i haven't learned you know very directly those non buddhist ancient uh, indian masters texts you know i've learned only when when we learn you know like dhammakirti uh, you know dhammakirti's text when we learn uh, chandakirti's text these great nalanda masters texts uh, we will uh, they have written they, they had written you know some of the day Uh, if i use that term opponents view point like for example what is his name uh, 
Baba Vika, Baba Vika, uh, I think he might be the fourth century uh, Nalanda master, very, 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 very learned Nalanda master. And, uh, you know, in his text, there, there are lots of, you know, uh, explanation uh, about the uh, non-Buddhist, you know, uh, great master's viewpoint, viewpoint. So I think it might be the same, but here, you know, these Nalanda masters like Deepnak, like Tamakiti, you know, they clearly stated, uh, they clearly stated the mind, conscious mind or consciousness or awareness, you know, uh, is, uh, their nature is not, you know, the matter. They are not matter. They are not physical. They are not physical. They are not matter. You know, they are non-physical, you know, non-matter. So in, in other words, you know, the, these Nalanda masters, Nalanda masters, when they, when they categorize all the functional things, when I say functional things, that, you know, the uh, things and events where they have a causal interaction, cause and effect interaction, these, you know, all these, uh, what you call the uh, functional things and events, they categorize into three groups: form, rupa, you know, or matter, and consciousness. Second, which is very very different uh, entity from the form, and then the third, neither form non uh, non consciousness. There's a third category. And, you know, they put it in this. So these two, though, you know, uh, our, you know, operation or functional, fun, uh, functional for our, our consciousness, either sense consciousness or the mental consciousness, they to function may depend on, rely on, you know, the matters, you know, the, taking into as an object or matter may be the part of the causes, conditions to occur, to arise, you know, the sense consciousnesses or mental consciousnesses. Nevertheless, in terms of the, the basic entity is very, very uh, different. One is matter. That means, you know, the building blocks, the basic, basic building blocks of the matter are the, you know, the subatomic um, or whatever, you know, atoms or whatever, but the building blocks of the consciousness is not, is not, you know, this kind of uh, uh, atoms or this Chinese or sub, you know, sub, uh, these uh, finest uh, subtle atoms, no. So these, that is the one thing which, you know, when we talk about the nature of the mind, also need to bear in mind. And these uh, great Indian masters, Nanada masters, holding that kind of, uh, you know, the position, de you know, uh, demarcating or the differentiating in terms of the entity, basic entity, the matter and consciousness, consciousness are different, which based on that, again, many, you know, uh, what you call the uh, practices and the theories uh, philosophical theories are also developed. Uh, yesterday, somebody asked, yesterday or day before yesterday, somebody asked, you know, the, uh, uh, what is the connection between the consciousness and neuro, uh, you know, the uh, uh, neurologist or ne neuro, you know, neuro connection. And uh, th these are the something which we need to now need to explore, explore. You know, as I mentioned yesterday, and uh, during those great Indian masters time, you know, the brain is not uh, that, you know, the, uh, the source to, to debate or to learn and what, but now that is, and it is further uh, more and more, you know, the um, uh, advanced technology may reveal further 
what is the connection between the consciousness and the brain, function of the brains, and so forth. So that is uh, one thing which uh, I would like to say in relation to the nature of the mind. Nature of the mind. Now the I will uh, now I will move on. I will not talk on the nature of the mind, which I said a little bit yesterday, and now uh, added a little bit today, uh, because as I mentioned, it has a, it has a lots of interpretation, explanation, you know, from the philosophical point of view, from the philosophical point of view, which is slightly different topic that we are dealing with the current hour lecture. So I will not go. Now uh, the next. That point I want to look at is, you know, the, what are the differences between the sense consciousness, sense consciousnesses or sense consciousness, and the sixth the mental consciousness, sixth the mental consciousness. So now the uh, either the either the sense consciousness from the eye or the side to the tactile fifth. Uh, or the sixth, the mental consciousness, they are, uh, to 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 occur or to come into function, to come into function, they all are dependent on three conditions, three conditions, which I thought may be quite uh, helpful to mention this. Three conditions, and uh, you know the the the. Uh, these three conditions, and then looking at these three conditions, then we will see the difference between the sense consciousness and the mental sixth mental consciousness. Now, the, what are the, those three? You know, the conditions. Just give you a list. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned already several times, you know, when I was leading classes in the West, uh, particularly in the Buddhist, in the, what you call the environment. Uh, Westerners, uh, they don't like that much uh, lists. As, as soon as you start to say lists, okay, there are five, there are 10 or there are 12, which is the case, like particularly when we are talking about, you know, mapping the consciousness, then we have to look at, okay, the, Different categories, different groups, different, and uh, as soon as I start to talk about the list, uh, they they will uh, although they may take lots of notes, they are very very good at taking notes, but uh, they they immediately feel okay, go on again list. <laughs> so, but anyway, here this list I'm going to say that the first uh, first condition is uh, called objective objective condition. In Tibetan, it's called Again, objective condition. So first, I will go the three lists. Then I will come back. What what are the difference uh, between those three conditions? And the second uh, condition is called dominant uh, condition, or sometimes some scholars use the term uh, uncommon dominant condition. So that's the second condition. And the third condition is called, uh, in Tibetan, second condition is called Dakin. And the third condition in Tibetan is called Tamatakin, and it is translated in English, uh, immediately preceding condition, immediately preceding condition. So, uh, according to these Nalanda masters, every, whether uh, valid consciousness, or invalid consciousness, whether mistaken consciousness or um, non-mistaken consciousness, either sense consciousness or the mental consciousness. As as long as it is consciousness, it uh, that that uh, that occurs that arises within ourselves based on these three uh, conditions, based on these three conditions. So now, objective condition. Objective condition is referring to, I, for example, now take an example, my eye consciousness. My eyes see the screen 
and I, at the moment I'm seeing my own image. It seems now I'm get used to, you know, initially when I give this talk with the online like this, and it seems sometimes I feel I'm talking to myself. Now I'm a little bit get used to it because I've done quite a lot. And uh, so my eye consciousness, perceiving the image of myself in this, you know, on the screen, that is objective condition. My eye consciousness to arise into function at the moment, I'm talking about right here and now, every moment, that is uh, what you call the you know, objective condition. Of course, it will change to other uh, sense uh, when you talk about other consciousness, like sense consciousness, you know, the, uh, my ear consciousness, ear consciousness, the hearing the sound, that sound, blah, 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 that's, that sound is objective condition. And it will move to the mental consciousness too. You know, at night, when you have a very sound sleep, and at the sound sleep, when we have a very pleasant dream, going on holiday, <laughs> uh, and uh, lying down in a golden beach, <laughs> you know, the, I, uh, when I was in the West, I used to go on holiday because that is the part of the culture. I mean, of course, not everybody, you know, not all has that kind of luxury, but uh, it is part of culture. You know, in the summer, uh, they go to uh, South Spain or somewhere to lay down uh, hours in the burning you know, sun. And <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, I lost my, my making joke. I lost my, <laughs> my 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 point. Anyway, so that is, so the when you know having a nice dream, having a nice dream, that what we what we are what mental consciousness is dreaming, and that is the objective condition. That is the objective condition. So. Each and every consciousness, as soon as it occurs, whether it stays short moment or it stays momentarily, moment by moment, it stays, you know, lit longer, they have objective, uh, you know, the condition. But that object might be completely non-existent, non-existent. For example, for example, you know, the uh in uh in in a in a hot death when you when you walk in a hot death uh, in the hot climate in the desert and in the long distance seeing image uh, seeing mirage that image of water like water there's no water so the you know or that uh, you know the traditionally uh, some of the, uh, you know, the masters have used. Uh, anyway, so I will not, otherwise we, will, we won't have any time. So that is the, uh, what is perceived, what is perceived by our, conscious, uh, by our consciousness is the, you know, objective condition. Each and every consciousness must have that object, but whether that object is, uh, Existing object or not, that is different. Different matter. Now the second uh, condition is called dominant condition. Dominant condition in Tibetan, Dagen. That is very powerful. So the, uh, whether whether it's uh, sense consciousness or the mental consciousness is defined from this second condition, dominant condition. Dominant condition. Sometimes the term is used uncommon dominant condition to the sense consciousness, uncommon in Tibetan. And um, you know the uncommon uh, so the uncommon in the sense to differentiate the usage of term uncommon is to differentiate, you know, the, from the uh, 
the third, second, second condition uh, with regard to the men mental consciousness. Okay, what is that? That is, you know, the, uh, the, in English, it is term is used in a sense faculty, sense faculty. Yesterday, uh, with the relation to the somebody's question, the question which I just earlier touched on, you know, the uh, question was, what is the connection between the brain and the consciousness? And I mentioned briefly, that is what here, this sense uh, faculty, that's how it is translated in, in English. In Tibetan, Ombo Sujen Tangwa, Ombo Sujen Tangwa. So the, all the five sense consciousnesses, side to the tactile consciousness, all the five sense consciousnesses, their sense faculty, their sense faculty, each conscious sight have its own sense faculty, ear have its own sense faculty, nose have its own, nose sense consciousness have its own, and so forth, up to the tactile, they, though they have their own sense faculty, they share, these sense faculties share one, uh, what you call the symbol feature, that is, they all are what is called in, in Tibetan Sukjen Tangwa. Sukjen Tangwa. Sukjen Tangwa literally it means a clear, subtle form. A clear, subtle form. We don't know. I have no idea. I have, I have, uh, we have lots of debate where, it, where it's located, where it, <laughs> what it is that, you know, which I mentioned yesterday, you know, cannot be perceived cannot be seen by our sense conscious uh, by our naked sense consciousness you know it is said why it is very uh, how it is defined as a tiny you know sense tiny that kind of clear form uh, and tiny in the sense our ordinary unless if uh, our sight like these days there are lots of powerful microscope it may if these uh, Nalanda masters, they know what is that and uh, what kind of shapes and colors and form it may have. And they may, uh, you know, using modern technology, make those very powerful microscopes may able to, but it is not clearly mentioned where it's located. Although there are some speculations where, it, they, where they are located, but not very uh, convincing. But that it is said. It is, that's how they, they all, so this is the second, you know, the condition, dominant condition. Now, mental consciousness, to the mental consciousness, that second condition, the dominant con condition is very, very different from the sense consciousnesses, five sense consciousnesses. The mental six, the mental consciousness, the second condition, dominant condition is not matter, not a, a subtle form. It is a level of consciousness. It is a level of consciousness. Some master, some great Indian master, you know, the, to when it comes to the, what you call the uh, uh, mental consciousness, not the sense consciousness, six, the mental consciousness, then talk about instead of three, talk about only two, you know, the conditions. The two are the object, 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 objective condition and the immediate preceding condition. Because they don't see that much difference between the second and the third when it comes to the, uh, the uh, mental consciousness in terms of the condition. They don't see that much different between the, you know, the, uh, the second dominant condition and the third immediate preceding uh, condition. So that is the difference between the sense consciousness uh, and the mental consciousness. And what is immediately preceding condition? Immediately preceding condition, you know, is refers to, you know, it is refers to previous moment of consciousness. So in other words, either the sense consciousness or the mental consciousness Every single consciousness, present consciousness, is uh, has 
pry sort of another consciousness. That pry another that another consciousness really like the knock, like in. So that is what here the third consciousness, third condition, immediately preceding condition. It is a you know the a pry moment of consciousness, the moment my eye consciousness, at right here and now, seeing my own image on the screen. Its immediately preceding condition is what I'm that I consciousness, which is at the moment, the prior to that moment. There's a, it can be the con, I consciousness. It can be another consciousness. Not necessarily. It should be the same, you know, uh, sort of con, the same consciousness. If uh, I consciousness, you know, it not necessarily. Uh, what you call the immediately preceding condition, not necessarily it should be I consciousness. It can be another consciousness, but there should be, uh, there must be a pry consciousness. So that those are the three conditions, which is quite interesting to explore, to think about, and they, 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 these also have uh, some, you know, the practical. Practical in the sense, working with our minds, dealing with our minds, either enhancing compassion, love, tolerance, all those positive minds, or you know, and reducing, eliminating some of those unhealthy and unhelpful emotions and thoughts. And if we understand these, like those these three conditions, you know, which help, which help to rise. The moment of consciousness, moment of mind or the awareness. Yeah, so that is here, uh, which is I thought is quite useful uh, to uh, to say this. Uh, now the uh, uh, this is what we have done. Mm -hmm. Now the uh, now another difference between the sense consciousness. And the mental consciousness. The one different we already mentioned that out of the three conditions, second condition is different. Now the another different is sense consciousness, like the my my like eyes, ears, nose, tactile. They their object, their object like my eyes. You know the uh, the first condition, which is objective condition, the uh, the color and the shape. Or the light. These are the, you know, like a like a like a camera, like a camera. There's nothing saying that that is nice color, that is nice shape, that's nice form. That kind of activity is not present at the sensory level. Sensory level, either nose, taste, tactile. Only mental consciousness do those activities. Do those activities. You know that. Uh, you know that. In other words, these two: sense consciousness, sense consciousness, and the mental consciousness. You know that they sort of. Uh, you know that sometimes. You know, they, they follow like the seeing a nice shape and colors, and it's seeing, thinking nice shapes and color is the mental consciousness. Perceiving the shapes and color is the sense consciousness. Adding or detecting, deducting, you know, the, the qualities or the labels, all these other. Mental consciousness, sense consciousness, nurses do not do, do not have that kind of capacity. So, in other words, sense consciousness, their object is the present, only at the present, right here and now. In terms of the time, in terms of the place, it is very much in a present local locality. The Mental consciousness, for example, moment I close my eyes, my mental consciousness 
when it starts to think my image on the screen with the reading glasses. That is the mental consciousness. It doesn't need that external, that, you know, the actual image. As I mentioned yesterday, I can clearly imagine my uh, 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 studying room back in London when I was. But that is mental consciousness. Although there's a shape, colors, the bookshelves, uh, the tables, all these are there, not real, but in the image, but uh, you know, that is, so uh, that is the one thing which we are quite useful to remember and to think about. So in other words, uh, uh, I think, you know, the, we all know the the adding quality or detecting detecting qualities on the things in events, shapes, colors, smell, taste, tactile is done only at the mental consciousness level, not from the sense consciousness, uh, sense consciousness. So in that sense, in that sense, mental consciousnesses are, uh, my mental consciousness is more powerful than the sense consciousness. However, and here I would like to add it on a little bit, you know, the, from the practical point of view, which is quite useful, you know. Now, if we, if we, you know, examine, say, an hour, an hour, close our eyes, you know, to, if I ask you to think, to recall, you know, within this hour, what you have, See, you know what is what what happens in your life what happens in your life 99 oops 99.9% like us 99.9% you know our uh, uh, what we are able to remember is only a connection with the sense consciousnesses and if you do that for the week or month or year or decade, most of the things that we can remember, that we can recall, either pleasant or unpleasant or whatever, most of I, I, my analysis, you know, uh, uh, come across 99% are mainly connection with the sensory consciousness, relation to the sense consciousness you know, uh, things and events. At the same time, if we, you know, uh, say the a wish, I wish this is going to happen, I, I, if we put a, what, bucket of wish lists, you know, the, in the West, I'm sure you, you do here in, the, in, in India too. I haven't seen in Tibetan community yet. <laughs> but uh, some modern young Tibetan may they, they may do the same. You know, in the West, when somebody got a terminal uh, illness, you know, terminal illness, and particularly the younger generations, and they, you know, the uh, family or the the person himself or herself, you know, they will say, okay, what is my bucket list, list of you know to do before I leave this life then most of the things are just real. I, I can understand. We, I totally understand. I shouldn't laugh because I understand. So why I'm saying these two, if we look at it in the past, if we recall the past, what we have done, what we do, 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 or what we would like to do, or what we like to have in the future, 90% or 95% are very much related to the sense, sensory level, not at the mental level, mental level. Though, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, when these great Indian masters, when they put all the functional things into these three uh, groups, three groups, there are things which are, you know, uh, uh, 
which call not form, not sense sense objects, like the consciousness itself, and also the uh, with the third category, non form and non consciousness. Like for example, for example, you know this I'm going to bring here. These great Indian masters, Nagarjuna and so forth, they found out it is extremely helpful and useful, meaningful, and also some cases very, uh, what you call the soothing, if we, if we uh, constantly recall the nature of impermanence, nature of impermanence, which is, you know, the impermanence is the object of one of the object, one of the objects of the mental consciousness. Impermanent is not object of sense consciousnesses. You know, the impermanent is the objects of mental consciousness. All the things and events including my this body, you know, including my this body, which with me last 63 years, and which I ch you know, cherish very much, and I want to keep very as healthy as possible, doing lots of exercises, looking at my diet, and so on and so forth. And it is the same uh, many of us. But it is impermanent, this body. And these Narendra masters have repeatedly said, understanding that nature, the nature of impermanent, of our things and events, is extremely helpful. When I say extremely helpful, I'm talking about this. You know, that many of our Deep, uh, which do you remember uh, the other day I mentioned that say, uh, Buddha, uh, the historical Buddha, and many Buddhist masters, and also many other ancient Indian masters, you know, talk about, you know, the predicament in this samsara, predicament or the challenges in this samsara, and among the among those challenges, inner challenges are the fears, concerns worries and so forth and many of you know deep rooted fears are due to not recalling not understanding this the nature of impermanence of this what we have got sooner or later sooner or later we have to leave everything behind us. But we don't think on that, we don't reflect on that, we don't recall on that. So that is what here, uh, why I'm saying that is this, you know, the, though the, our mental consciousness is more powerful than the, our sense consciousness to understand the, some of the most important things that we need to understand, but we don't use that much our mental consciousness. When I say we don't use that much our mental consciousness, that doesn't mean our mental consciousness stay dormant, dormant, you know, all the time. No, it is extremely active. But act, active in the in the manner in uh, the, that kind of very busyness is only to do with the sense following the sense consciousness's information. Wanting, to, you know, these shapes and colors, smell and taste and tactile, you know, they try to make those things, you know, either the unpleasant to be dispelled, pleasant to be collected, and, you know, lots of things. So that is something which here I feel is important for us to, me to say this. Uh, relation to the when we are talking about you know the uh, uh, what you call the uh, sense sense consciousness and the uh, uh, mental consciousness so the difference 
Now that uh, we have a few minutes, then I will uh, leave for question and answer. Uh, another step uh, that uh, which these great masters talk about is, you know, conceptual conceptual mind within the within the consciousness, either sense consciousness or the mental consciousness. Some are conceptual mind or conceptual conceptualization or conceptuality, whatever term now I don't know how to make it. You know the conceptual topa in Tibetan topa conceptual. Some are non-conceptual. You know, some are non-conceptual. That doesn't mean one is better than the other, but uh, uh, the, our consciousness, our awareness, our mind fall in the another category that is called conceptual or conceptualization and non-conceptualization. You know, Tokpa Tongmin uh, in Tibetan. Tokpa Tongmin. And all the sense consciousnesses all the sense consciousness, those five sense consciousnesses, are in the second category, domin, you know, non-conceptualization, non-conceptual mind or consciousness, all the sense consciousness. But when it comes to the mental consciousness, which is the sixth mental consciousness, and then some mental conscious, uh, some mental consciousnesses are uh, you know, the conceptual, some mental consciousnesses are non-conceptual. So now come back again to the uh, sense consciousnesses. I said five sense consciousnesses are all the time non-conceptual consciousness. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean they are all the time innocent, no. You know, non-concept, non-conceptualization non doesn't mean, uh, you know, sense consciousnesses are free from distortion. No. It is simply, you know, the uh, how they interact with their object, how they interact, the manner or the process of interacting with the object, all the sense consciousnesses, as I mentioned earlier. All the sense consciousnesses, when they interact with their object, they interact all the time directly, without any what you call the, um, you know, the, the veil or without any uh, what you call the uh, another vehicle, another vehicle or another sort of you know the, the means or the methods. They always deal with the direct. With their object, whether that object is what you call uh, existing object or non-existent object, it doesn't matter. But it always deal deal with a uh, deal directly, and that's what you know. We will come a little bit this uh, next my my talk. Uh, what it mean directly, uh, which has lots of different interpretations among these great Nalanda masters, but. Non -con uh, the conceptual mind, conceptual mind, whether it is correct conceptual mind, whether it's a valid concept uh, conceptual mind, or the non valid, incorrect, mistaken conceptual mind, you know, the conceptual minds, when that mind engage, engages with, it, uh, uh, with its object, it always engages by something. Why something? In Tibetan, that something is called Dajitam Tunji. So there are two, which uh, uh, which is a little bit, you know, the uh, uh, what you call the philosophical viewpoint, but it is quite useful one. And uh, quite often, uh, you know, the, these days they, uh, the name and the category, like the, you know, the table, chair, all these names, they, they, the conceptual mind engage, engages with the object, with certain wide, these kind of language, uh, category, uh, and so on and so forth. They cannot 
uh, engage, they cannot engage with their objects directly like the sense consciousness. Right. So, okay. So uh, this I want to explore a little bit further in our next, uh, my talk, which I thought quite useful to do that. And now I will leave it here to have some questions uh, and answer. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, okay, Keshika, you. for your lovely talk on the nature of consciousness. We learned a lot from you, and uh, there's only one question for you. Okay. Um, from Anita. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, my question, Geshala, is uh -huh. about the uh, you said direct perception and conceptual uh -huh. perception, right? So in yes. conceptual perception, you said um, also again direct is one direct conception uh, perception, right? So how? So, could you explain a bit about that? Uh, can you can you repeat it, your uh, question yeah. again? So yes, there I... was a direct perceiver. Okay, yes. One and conceptual mind, right? Yes, 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 yes. Now, conceptual mind again is divided into also there's a subdivision of a direct conceptual mind, right? Uh, no. As soon as as soon as you say the conceptual mind, then we have to drop that word direct. There's no, you know, uh, what I said is, you, maybe I've, I've said wrongly, what I've said is sense consciousnesses are, you know, the direct perception or, you know, the uh, non-conceptualization, that is the both are same, direct perception or the non-conceptualization, non they are referring to the same, all the sense consciousness, so whether they are valid or invalid, it doesn't matter as long as it is sense consciousness, sense consciousness, then it is direct perception and it is non-conceptualization. That means it is not conceptual. Now the mental consciousness, when it comes to the mental consciousness, then there are two. Mental consciousness, which is the sixth. Mental consciousness can be direct perceiver, if, you, uh, if I use that term that you use, or mental consciousness can be non-conceptualization or mental consciousness can be conceptualization or the conceptual. So that means in the mental consciousness, it can be direct uh, perception or it can be conceptual mental states. So that is, is that your question? Yes, my question was that uh, the direct mental conception that's okay. what I'm asking about. Yes. So, how would you explain that further? I mean, usually. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, when when it comes to direct mental uh, or the you know we can say the non conceptual uh, mental consciousness, which is non conceptualization, that is or the direct perception of the mental consciousness. Direct perception of a direct a direct perception of a mental consciousness usually occurs at the two levels. At the two levels, at the uh, these Nalanda masters like uh, Dignak and Dhammakirti, you know they talk a lot about this. Yingun in Tibetan it says Yi Jingusun, Yi Mun. That means. Yi means the mental consciousness, six, the mental consciousness. Mun means mun yurwa, that means direct. So the, here, two levels, two levels. The first one is, you know, constantly occur, we, but we ordinary people have a difficult to, uh, uh, difficult to hold on or difficult to experience that is pure direct mental consciousness. It, it the duration is too short, and you know, like it is very much uh, uh, in certain ex extent, it is very elusive because the, its object is not very uh, what you call a not very 
you know, uh, when it occurs. It occurs in a certain preceding, uh, uh, what you call the manner, like my eye consciousness, seeing my image on the screen. When the, that eye consciousness moment of that function uh, ceases or stops, there is a, there is a, uh, what you call the uh, full, pos there is a possibility that a short period or short moment, a direct Percep uh, mental perception, uh, perception may occur, but I may not be able to my men, my I may not be able to you know hold on or apprehend on that, and that, that is what uh, this great master have said, happening all the time, but unable to hold it by the uh, individual or that direct perception has. Has hasn't got its own object to be to be held. Now another direct perception, which is what these masters have told, uh, have mentioned again and again. It is it will occur through the training, through the training. So now, which I briefly uh, touch on that, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, these great masters have. Uh, said again and again importance of having awareness awareness of you know aware of nature of impermanence of this body and this life this existence and that awareness that understanding or that you know awareness of nature of impermanence of my body if that awareness is you know do you remember uh, the first day I, 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 I mentioned these three steps of training our mind, three steps uh, to bringing knowledge, cultivating knowledge. That first one is through listening traditionally, second one is through contemplation, third one is through meditation in the sense repeating what you have understood again and again. So under these three processes, and when the third process is reached or is gained in a more advanced level, then eventually that may turn into direct perception. And this is called, uh, in Tibetan first, uh, Nelgyal Musum, and in, in, it is translated in Tibetan, Yogi, Yogi direct perception. Yogi direct perception. Yogi in the sense, you know, through the training our mind, our sixth mental, train our sixth mental consciousness to apprehend some of these, you know, uh, phenomena like nature of impermanence, nature of, you know, the dukkha, nature of the uh, samsaric predicament. When we, through these three stages, listening, then contemplating again and again, then conceptually understanding nature of impermanence, then that conceptual understanding of nature of impermanence is put into meditation, repeated again and again and again. Eventually, even due to that repetition, then that sixth mental consciousness. Initially, it is conceptual, but due to the reputation, then that may that will turn into direct perception, and that is why the term is called yogi. Although there are some other explanation, but this one is quite meaningful explanation. So, and now coming back to the your question. Then uh, direct mental perception, direct mental perception or mental consciousness has two two levels. One is which occurring all the time, every now and then within our mental state, but we ordinary people difficult to hold on that, grasp on that because it is very short moment. Why it is very short moment? Its object is not really obvious. And that is what here it is very short. But another one is you know, the 
when through the train, then we will have. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Geshela, for this uh, oh, yeah. explanation. <laughs> thank you. you. So th thank you very much, Geshela, for this session to make the complexity of our mind very simple. <laughs> yes. And uh, to all the audience, I mean, this is the last lecture of the online series. And we are going to have an offline session that is uh, that will uh, be in the conference hall at the administrative block of Goa University on the 19th, 20th, and 21st of April. So this is just a small announcement. All those who have registered will be receiving an email. So you all are welcome to come to Goa University and uh, also interact with uh, Geshila. I also would like to uh, thank the Foundation of, for Universal Responsibility of the HH Dalai Lama, uh, especially Mr. Rajiv Mehrotra, and of course, uh, Dr. Anita Dudhani, for uh, coordinating this session with us and uh, with all her happiness and smiles and always dedication towards the Dalai Lama. <laughs> yes. And uh, once again, thank you, Geshila, for your very informative talk and hope to see you in person in April. Yes. I hope the pandemic ends very soon okay. so all of us can be together. That's thank more you. effective. Yes. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for your patient hearing. And uh, I think we'll log out now. Yeah. And we'll see each other in April. Thank so you. See you on the 19th of April. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Even the it was clear.